Let's have a word of prayer together. Shall we pray? Father, we want to give you thanks so that, uh, God, you've blessed us with your word. And we live in a country where we are free to read it, we're free to own a Bible, we're free to teach it, and we pray it remains that way. But with that privilege, we pray to you, Lord, today that uh, you might speak to each one. We might have open hearts, open minds to receive from your holy scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> uh, well, just two, two days ago, two evenings ago, Friday evening here, uh, we saw a bunch of people baptised. It was a really wonderful occasion. Um, in fact, uh, there's been in the last 10 months, 11 people have been baptised, um, and a lot of them are actually from uh, unchurched backgrounds too. So it's always very exciting to see God moving in that way. Um, and so Emily, Nicole, Adam, Nathania and Zach were baptised uh, on Friday night a couple of evenings ago. Uh, it's always a privilege to baptise people. But a special privilege for me, I guess, to uh, baptise Zach because, of course, he's my own son. He's uh, the 13-year-old lad. You'll often see him on camera or occasionally at Christmas productions playing Tweedledee. <laughs> No, he was Tweedledum, actually. Yeah, sorry. No, Tom was Tweedledee. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, Zach made a, a recommitment one of our combined uh, youth events uh, a couple of months back, and I, I remember the very next morning he was there reading um, the Bible. He was in Genesis, and he's working his way through Genesis. He's been working his way through the whole Old Testament, and something else we've been doing is um, there's some very good, bi- um, good movies uh, on the of the old, old testament like they, i know there's some rubbish ones too but there are some very good ones and we've been working our way through a whole series of those too and um recently we zach and i completed this this book together growing in christ you heard me promoting it earlier uh this year so we've done the five studies zach has had no problem memorizing the five scriptures associated with each one um but um can i just suggest that um you know this really does help people grow you know it's helped zach grow um having made that recommitment. There are others in the church doing this and some on a one-on-one basis in the same sort of way uh, that Zach and I have just recently done it. The Word of God is key for helping people grow. It needs to be a priority in all of our lives. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be speaking on a, a topic today, uh, which is an important one, because I think sometimes when we read the Bible, including some of the Old Testament stuff that Zach and I are looking at at the moment, is people can not quite know what to do with an Old Testament passage. And they just think, oh, I've got to do that. When actually, no, we live under the new covenant, not everything relates. Um, Can I put it this way? You heard me say this last week. We learn from the old covenant, but we live under the new. And it's something, a concept that we need to understand. Um, Today, my title is Old and New Covenant. Old and New Covenant. And uh, last week, remember, we, we looked at a passage where there was a, a, a bunch of people, some of them Pharisees, who had dragged a woman caught in the act of adultery before Jesus. And they said, the, you know, the Old Testament law commands we stone such women. What do you say? And uh, Jesus writes in the sand, and as I said, possibly wrote some of the commands of Scripture in the sand, and then says to them, stands up and says to them, the one who was without sin, let that be the person to cast the first stone. And we see how Jesus brings the new covenant in, and which we see him do quite often in ministry. Um, and friends, this is, this is the journey I want to just uh, do today. I want to go back to an Old Testament passage. And I, what I want to do with it is, on the one hand, we're going to see some stuff that won't relate to us today, but we're going to see some principles that do relate to us today. And so let's have a look at um, a passage here. Uh, you know, let me tell the story first. It starts kind of with the story of Joshua. And uh, so it's from the book of Joshua. And you think of the walls of Jericho. That was possibly the most uh, difficult city to take. It was very heavily fortified, thick walls. The walls were so thick that there were even rooms and stuff built into those walls, like accommodation. And it, it really, there's no way they could, they could defeat that city without a miracle of God. And God stepped in and the walls broke down. And we see this tremendous victory. And I'm sure... The nation was at a spiritual height, is thinking, this is awesome. Our God is working with us. We're now taking the land on the western side of the Jordan River. This is just fantastic. But something happened. Let me pick it up here. I'm going to read uh, Joshua 6.24. It says, they burned the whole city 
and everything in it, but the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron, uh, they, were, they were brought into the treasury of the Lord's house. So that's what God had told them. Silver and gold, we're going to need that for the temple. And so that's what the people would do. Rather than destroying it or rather than taking it for themselves, it was to be kept for the Lord's temple. Everyone obeyed that except one family. Joshua 7.1. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. From the important tribe of Judah, the same line that Jesus is born from, one of the families of the tribe of Judah took the silver and the gold for themselves. Joshua 7.2, the next verse. Now Joshua sent the man from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. So the plan was Ai, it's just a small village really. That was the next city, or in this case village, that they were planning on capturing, on taking. 7, 3 through 5, it says, when they returned to Joshua, they said, oh, not all the army need to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it. Do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai who killed about 36 of them. What happened? Incredible city of Jericho, heavily fortified, big city. They took it, no problem. They conquered it. Little village of Ai. They can't do anything. 36 of their men are killed, no mention of anyone in Ai being killed. They were defeated by them. Why? Well, because God's protection, his hand, his presence, his victory was lifted from the nation because there was sin in the camp. Verse 6 and 7. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same thing, sprinkled dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Immediately there, he's not praying according to God's will. He knows that God has told Moses, has told him, that they are to take the land of the western side of the Jordan, not only the east. But when circumstances go wrong, you start to question God's will. Very natural thing to do. Um, A great memory verse. It's uh, actually all the baptism people got this verse on a a bookmark that Helen had nicely made for them. Now, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. It's hard to trust when the circumstances go bad. And that's what's happened to Josh. Josh was just thinking, oh, what's going on? What's going on? You know, have I got this wrong? Should I not be crossing Um, to the western side of the Jordan and taking cities? 7, 8, and 9, it says, Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? And Joshua means this. He's a devout man of God. He cares about not just the nation but also God's reputation. But you can see here he's praying with anxieties. He's filled with fear. He's thinking, oh, my goodness. You know, um, you see, the people of Jericho, they were, they were really nervous about what was going on because they'd heard about the people, the desert people with their desert god who had come in and were conquering people everywhere. And they, but now this little town of Ai has defeated Israel. And Josh was just thinking, oh, it's going to get out. People are going to hear about this. The other nations are going to hear about it. They're all going to come against us and conquer us and wipe us out. Notice what the Lord says here. Prayer is not always the right thing to do. The Lord says, 7.10, The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. What's God saying? 
He's saying it's not about prayer at the moment, Joshua. There's a reason why you were defeated. It's because of sin. It's interesting, isn't it? Just how serious this was that, um, you know, Achan takes some of the silver, some of the gold, keeps it for himself, and God is really quite angered by this. It's a challenge to us, I guess, that um, are we devoted to giving into God's work? Or do we just consider all the financial blessings that we have are just ours and we do what we like with them? Well, the next few verses record the process of discovering who the guilty family was. Let's pick it up in verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honour him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. He gives him the opportunity to confess. Achan replied, it is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. Now notice this verse, very important verse, 21. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them. Notice that. I coveted them and, and took them. I took them. They are hidden hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Uh, I'll give you an idea of the value of, of the stuff. Uh, 200 shekels of silver, that's about 2.2 kg of silver. Today valued in Australia at about $2,700. Um, the gold bar weighing about 50 shekels, that's just over half kg. That's about 50 grand for a bar of gold, about 50 grand's worth there. The important thing we see in this passage is something that reveals how sin captivates someone. Look at these four things. A pattern of falling into sin. He saw. Nothing wrong with seeing the stuff. That's not sinful. But then he coveted. You know, the Tenth Commandment in, in the Ten Commandments is all about coveting. Do not covet stuff. Don't desire stuff with your heart that's not yours. He looks at it, then he starts to covet that gold. 50 grand. Man, that could be so helpful. You actually learn later, he's not a, not a poor man. He's got, a, he's got flocks and herds, you know. So he's not a poor man, but yep, he sees that gold. Then he acts upon that covetous desire. He took it. And then, of course, because he'd taken it, he needed to hide it. Four principles there in the way that sin often operates, how the pattern of falling into sin operates. Let me tell you the story of Jimmy Backer. Some of you immediately know what I'm talking about. He used to run the PTL club, um, Praise the Lord club. And that particular uh, TV show was extremely popular. So in the late 70s, early 80s, um, they had about 13 million viewers in the United States and it was carried by about 100 networks. So a popular show. I mean, I've watched a few of them, you know, even in recent times. Very, very well put together. You know, you're often interviewing some... A famous person, they've come to faith in Christ and you hear their story and, uh, or it might be someone running a, a crazily cool ministry and very, very good stuff, you know, great the way they put it together. They knew what they were doing. Um, in the early 80s, uh, they built Heritage USA. That's a kind of uh, Christian Disneyland. It was in Fort Mill, South Carolina. And I tell you what, Jimmy certainly knows how to do business. I mean, mate, that was the third most successful theme park in all of USA. So, man, yeah, he was a very astute businessman. Later, uh, they decided they would include a luxury hotel for people and build that. And that was built between 84 and 87. And they asked people from their television show to donate towards that. And if anyone donated a substantial amount, they immediately got three nights accommodation at that hotel every year for the rest of their lives. However, they oversold. They had uh, about 152,000 people, gave generously towards that. They had about 500 rooms. They couldn't quite honour that. Now, you can get around something like that. You can probably deal with that and do something else. But there's something else he did that was actually much worse. The amount of money that came in to see that hotel built was about twice what they needed. Um, and so that spare, 3.4 million, Jimmy thought, I'll pocket that for myself. 
Equivalent, this was in 1987, so it would be equivalent to about 9 million today. Um, what happened? Well, you see, he saw all that extra money come in. He coveted that money. The sort of guy I like to live a fairly decadent lifestyle. And then he took that money. And then, of course, he had to hide what he'd done. He saw, he coveted, he took. And he hid. <clears throat> well, it's not easy to get away with stuff like that. He was convicted of fraud in 1989 and spent five years in prison. When I was at um, my Bible college, there was a Kenyan pastor who had come out to preach to us students, and um, this was early 90s, and so the Jimmy Backer thing was all quite fresh at that time. And uh, he said he knew Jimmy. He remembered in the 80s uh, visiting you know, his, uh, all, all his ministry stuff, you know, including his church. And he's been shown around his church and um, there's one point when Jimmy hops on stage and he's, you know, tinkling the ivories of this extraordinarily expensive grand piano and the Kenyan pastor, the pastor was telling me about this, the Kenyan guy, and he said, I said to Jimmy, Jimmy, do you really need all of this? Do you really need all of this? which Jimmy immediately seemed a little bit taken back, and then the, the Kenyan guy was just saying to me, and then I really felt I had a word for him from the Lord. I said, Jimmy, I really say this in love. I think with this covetous desire that you have for so many things, you're going to fall. You're headed for a fall if you don't do something about this. He said Jimmy didn't receive that too well. But a few years later, indeed, of course, that did happen. God had sent someone to warn him, but he didn't listen. But you see, it's not just about money. Those four principles I've shared with you about seeing, about coveting, about taking, and about hiding, that can, that can be the case for so many different areas of sin, not just money. <clears throat> Let's pick up the passage as we go on a little further. Joshua 7.22, it says, so Joshua sent messages and they ran to the tent. And there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. So they confirmed that it had been stolen. Then Joshua, together with all of Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. What's he saying? Well, because of Achan's sin, 36 people are dead. You've got grieving wives, you've got grieving kids. The sin affected other people. <clears throat> now, can I make this point? An individual sin may negatively affect others. An individual sin may negatively affect others. Well, the passage goes on like this. Second part of verse 25. Then all of Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor, ever since. One of the things I should point out is Joshua gave Achan a chance to repent. My son, tell me what you've done. He owned up. He confessed. What does that mean? Well, that mean, it means he and his family souls are saved, but they still carried out that capital punishment. Does that relate to us today? As I tell you what, you go back in church history, people being burnt at the stake and stuff, People tried to apply an Old Testament thing into the New Covenant. Well, there's nothing of that in the New Covenant. In fact, if you were going to try and defend anyone, like I said last week, it would be Jesus himself. And Peter does, grabs a sword, tries to defend him, and Jesus says, put away your sword. No place for that in the New Covenant. We live under a different covenant. But on the other hand, 
We learned a principle in there, though, didn't we? We live under the new, but we learn from the old. Look, let's pop up this principle here, a pattern of falling into sin. This is what we've learned. The pattern that we can learn from, which is still human nature, is still the same. We fall into sin because we see, we covet, that's desiring it, we act on that, we take it, and then we hide that sin away. And as we also learned, an individual sin may negatively affect others. You see, you covet, you take, you hide, and that sin can affect other people too. There's the principle we learn from the old passage. So it doesn't mean we start stoning people. That's an old covenant thing. But there are principles we can learn from in the passage. This is a great little phrase to keep in your mind. We learn from the old covenant, but we live under the new covenant. We learn from the old covenant, but we live under the new covenant. Like I said, my title this week is Old and New Covenant. I want to take you into the new. And I want to, I want to just... Um, get you to cast your eyes over a classic passage that the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Colossians where he talks about the work on the cross of Jesus and he then immediately applies to how this affects the new covenant. Let's have a look at this. Colossians 2.13, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Notice what he immediately goes on to say. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, the food laws of the Old Testament, or in regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day, all the holy days of the Old Testament. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. You see what he's saying? The food laws don't apply. The, the, the holy days, the special days of the Old Covenant, they don't apply anymore. They're a shadow of the things to come. It's all fulfilled now in Christ. So, for instance, you occasionally may come across someone who thinks that we should be meeting on the Sabbath day. What is the Sabbath day? The seventh day, the Saturday, because that was the old covenant principle. Keep the Sabbath day holy. What did the early church do? Well, let's have a look at uh, Acts chapter 2. This is the birth of the church, that chapter, and it starts to go on and describe what the early church looked like. Look at this, Acts 2.46. It says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. Every day they met in the temple courts. Every day, early in the morning, they would come into the temple courts, they would sing praises to God, and one of the apostles would preach. It wasn't just the Sabbath day, it was every day. In fact, if there's a revival, I've studied uh, revival quite extensively, actually, so often when revival takes places, churches don't just meet once or twice a week, they meet every single day. They run a service every night and even beyond. When there's a move of God, everyone just wants to be at church. They want to listen to the word. They want to sing God's praises. People are getting saved left, right and centre. It's a big shift in people's priorities. Well, the early church, that's exactly what was happening. They would meet every day in the temple courts, thousands of them. That church grew so rapidly. Well, but look, if you were to single out a particular day where there's definitely um, a concentration of organisation, If anything, it would have been the first day of the week, the Sunday. Let's have a look at this here. In this case, it's talking about the collection, the offering. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, this is an offering being taken up for the churches in Jerusalem that were struggling at the time, uh, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. Notice this. On the first day of every week, not the seventh day, on the first day, which is the Sunday, on the first day of every week, Each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, the collections, uh, uh, when I come, no collections will have to be made. What's he saying? The Apostle Paul saying, look, we we need to, he's getting all the churches together around around the Mediterranean world saying, look, Jerusalem really needs our help at the moment. I want you to set us, when you take up your normal offering, first day of the week, the Sunday, set aside some of your offering for the needy churches of Jerusalem. 
And when was that taking place? It was taking place on the first day of the week. So if any day was be their more organised day, it was the first day, not the Sabbath day. But as I shared before, it's not about a special day anymore. Every day is the Lord's day under the new covenant. What about the food laws? Let's have a look here at what uh, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy. He's one of his pastors. He says this, 1 Timothy 4, 1. The Spirit clearly says in latter times, some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry. You know any movements that do that? The priest or the pastor is not allowed to marry? It's not in the Bible. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. In other words, it doesn't matter what you're eating. It doesn't matter what it is like pork or crustaceans, which were not to be eaten in the Old Testament. If you pray, you give thanks, then it's sanctified. You unsure about that? Let's see what Jesus himself said. Mark 7, 18. Here again, Jesus ushering in the new covenant. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of their body. And Mark adds, clarifying what Jesus was saying, in stating this, in saying this, Jesus declared, all foods clean. Notice what it says? All foods are clean. There's no such thing as kosher food anymore for the new covenant. All foods are clean. You give thanks for it, it's clean. Now, it doesn't have to be a heated debate about this sort of stuff. you know. Um, and this is a, a, a passage I want, want you to see how Paul tries to simmer people down about all of this. Have a look here at um, Romans 14, 1 through 3. Except the one whose faith is weak, without quarrelling or disputing over disputable matters, one person's faith allows him to eat everything. But another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. That one who eats, uh, the one who eats everything, must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Now, I know one of the movements, for instance, my brother-in-law is a part of it, actually, the Seventh-day Adventists. They go back to the Garden of Eden and uh, they, they do honour the Sabbath day. They're very much caught up under the Old Testament law. Uh, they still believe in Jesus and his death on the cross and stuff, but they get caught up under the law. And they believe everyone should go back to Eden and just eat vegetables. You know, that's their push. Now, I'm not going to get into an angry debate with them about it, but I'm not going to let what they believe dictate what I do either. And that's really what Paul is saying. You know, be nice to one another, don't judge one another about it. But the reality is the one whose faith is weak eats only vegetables, he says. You know? My point again, we learn from the old covenant, but we live under the new. We learn from the old covenant, but we live under the new. Let me finish with this great little verse here from Paul. He says, so whether you eat or drink... Or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's the heart of it, isn't it? Well, as the worship team returns, let's close in prayer. Father, here today, um, we give you thanks for your word. But your word is not as helpful if it's not understood. And we see many uh, examples there in the New Testament where you raise up teachers of your word and prophets that preach from your word. And that's all part of our growing process. And so, Father, here today, we just want to pray that we would have a better grasp of your Bible. And for instance, when we're reading an Old Testament passage, we would be asking the question, what principles can I learn here? But also saying, is this new covenant stuff or not? And uh, understanding the Bible, correctly dividing the Bible with the guidance of your spirit and with the knowledge we receive through teachers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.